Today, we are going to the 19th century to look at the crimes of Lizzie Halliday, to sit back as we go to the USA. Lizzie Halliday was born in 1859 in the small town of Antrim, which at the time of her birth was in the northeastern part of the country of Ireland. She was one of ten children, and when she was very young, her family travelled across the Atlantic to start a new life in the USA. They settled in New York City, but when Lizzie was a teenager, she left and went to work in Pennsylvania. This would be a new start for her, as her reputation and violent behaviour were well known in New York, and living with such a large family in impoverished conditions in the 19th century wasn't easy. While in Pennsylvania, she met a man named Charles Hopkins, and they were married in 1879. They had one son together, but soon after they married, Charles died of what was later determined to be natural causes. Lizzie knew that life would be easier as a married woman. She had a son to look after, and she was young, so decided to find another husband. It didn't take long for her to marry an ex-army officer named Artemis Brewster, who came from Greenwich Village in Washington County. Their marriage, however, was not a particularly good one, and Lizzie constantly mistreated her husband. The unfortunate man suddenly died within a year of their marriage, and this time the cause of death was registered as unknown. Lizzie decided to marry again, so married George Smith, who had been an army comrade of her late second husband. Shortly after they married, she tried to poison George by putting arsenic in his tea. Fortunately, George survived this attempt on his life, but while he was recovering, Lizzie gathered all the couple's money and left the marital home and went to live with a man named Hiram Parkinson, who was many years her senior. It is not known if she married Hiram, but just three weeks after they ran off together, the elderly gentleman vanished without a trace. Lizzie then went to Vermont, where she married Charles Playstill, but strangely, only two weeks after the wedding, she disappeared. In 1888, Lizzie went with her son to Newborough in New York State, where she lodged with the McQuellan family, who were known to her from her days back in Ireland. Later, she went to Philadelphia, where she set up a shop, but unfortunately it burnt down and Lizzie immediately applied for the insurance payouts. The police investigated the incident and she was charged with arson and trying to defraud an insurance company. Lizzie was taken to court, found guilty and sentenced to two years in prison at the Eastern State Penitentiary. She was released in 1890 and found work as a housekeeper for an elderly widow named Paul Halliday a Union Army veteran who lived on a farm in Sullivan County, New York. He was at least 40 years older than Lizzie and had already raised five children, four of whom had moved away, but the fifth child, a boy called John, still lived at home. The lonely gentleman soon fell for his young housekeeper and the unlikely couple were married, meaning Lizzie became Mrs. Halliday. On the 6th of May, 1891, Part of the family's farmhouse caught fire and was destroyed, but most of the house was saved. Three weeks later, on May the 26, Lizzie burned down one of the large barns on the farm while her disabled stepson John was in it, and unable to escape, he died in the fire. The neighbours thought that she had deliberately started the fire to kill him, or had murdered him in the barn and set fire to it to hide her crime. Once the barn had burned down, she drove all of her husband's workhorses to the town of Newborough, where she sold them. This time Lizzie was arrested, and the authorities, believing her to be insane, committed her to the Middletown Asylum. The staff there found it difficult to control her, so she was transferred to the Auburn Asylum, where her violent behaviour continued, and she was again transferred for a third time, this time to the Matiawan Asylum. Lizzie, however, showed a marked improvement in her mental health once the case against her was dropped and the doctors declared her to be sane and she was released and returned to the farm. 
Her neighbours at the farm did not like her and kept their distance, but they were always aware of the movements to and from the farm. It soon became apparent that Paul Halliday had not been seen around the farm for several days. Fearing the worst, a group of neighbours asked Lizzie where her husband was, to which she replied he had gone to Bloomingburg to do some masonry work. The neighbours did not believe this, so contacted the police. Armed with a search warrant, the authorities arrived at the property and hoped they could find what had happened to Mr Halliday. Inside the house they found a bloodstained carpet, a gun cartridge and some rope. They continued looking and left the house and went to the barn. There they noticed that new hay had been stacked against the wall. They started to remove it, thinking that Paul Halliday might be underneath. But what they found was not what they were expecting. Under the hay they found the bodies of Mrs Margaret McQuellan and her daughter Sarah. This was a family that Lizzie had stayed with in Newborough in 1888. It later emerged that Lizzie had hired Sarah, the daughter, to work as a housekeeper at the farm. Both mother and daughter had had their hands tied across their chests and their feet and knees bound with ropes. The police then noticed a smell coming from under the floorboards in the kitchen of the house. So they took them up and unearthed the body of Paul Halliday. He had a fractured skull and had three bullet wounds in his chest. Lizzie was questioned, but she acted very strangely, refusing to answer any questions and speaking over the investigating officers. She kept on making irrelevant comments and at one point ripped off her blouse in an act some thought of faking insanity, but the debate on her mental state continued. While in custody, she refused to cooperate with the police and tried to set fire to the bed in her cell. It was decided that she would need to be restrained 24 hours a day, so was bound in chains and kept locked up in the cell. The press found the whole story fascinating and Lizzie became headline news. The trial of Lizzie Halliday started on the 21st of June, 1894. The case against her was only circumstantial, but the evidence was strong. Her attorney did little to challenge the testimony of prosecution witnesses, as he was confident that Lizzie would be acquitted on the grounds of insanity. Several doctors from the asylums where Lizzie had previously spent time testified that she was insane. The prosecution, however, presented their own evidence to try and prove that she was perfectly sane, and witnesses came forward to testify that in their opinion, her whole insanity thing was just an act. After deliberation, the jury found for the prosecution and Lizzie was found guilty of murder. She was the first female to be sentenced to die in the electric chair and it caused a sensation. When leaving court, surrounded by reporters, she attacked one of the officers assigned to escort her back to prison. His name was Harrison Beecher and Lizzie bit him on the hand. The hand became infected and Sheriff Beecher died from the wound. Many people still considered Lizzie to be insane and a commission was set up to determine her mental state and it was agreed by medical professionals that she was indeed insane and her sentence was commuted to life in prison. Lizzie was sent to the Matawan State Asylum where she continued her strange and violent ways. She attempted to escape and assaulted the guards. By 1906, 12 years since Lizzie was found guilty, she had become a trusted patient at the asylum. This was largely due to a young nurse named Nellie Wicks, who had helped Lizzie to take responsibility, and Lizzie became greatly attached to her. When Miss Wicks informed the prisoners that she was leaving to take up a regular nursing position, the news very much upset Lizzie, and she threatened to kill the nurse if she tried to leave. The threat was not taken seriously, but on September the 27th, 1906, Lizzie followed Miss Wicks into the dressing room, locked the door and began stabbing her with a pair of scissors. Miss Wicks died two hours later. When asked why she had committed the murder, Lizzie replied, because she tried to leave me. Elizabeth Margaret Halliday stayed at the asylum until her death on the 28th of June, 1918. 
and was buried in an unmarked grave in the grounds of the Matawan State Hospital. Some historians believe that Lizzie Halliday was Jack the Ripper. Investigations have apparently proved that she was in Europe at the time of the Whitechapel murders and it is reported that she often referred to the murders when she was talking to the guards. Hello everyone, thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave a comment or any feedback that you may have and let me know if you think that maybe Lizzie Halliday was Jack the Ripper and I will see you in the next brief case.